sponsored um, oral access session. I'm so happy um, to have presenters from all around the world. And we would like to start with, uh, if you could go to the agenda. Kaylee, could you go to the agenda for the abstract? Thank you. So um, we have five speakers this morning. Um, we will start with Dr. Joseph Naguda. He's a lecturer at the Nairobi, Kenya. He will be talking on antimicrobial, oops, sorry. Activity of the Solanum tovum hydroallic extract against important microbacterial strain. So this is an interest to me um, as a microbacterial um, TB specialist. And then we will go to Dr. Gavina Rajmojan, who's a senior principal investigator at the CSIR Institute of Microbial Technology in India, who will be discussing the role of um, flavohemoglobin from multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus in cellular physiology and virulence. And then we will go to Dr. Rafael Vieira, professor of the Federal University of Parana in Brazil. Um, he will be discussing hematomatic mycoplasma species and tick-borne disease pathogens in white ear possums um, near the Iguazu City, Parana State, southern Brazil, a tri-border of the Brazil Parana. Paraguay and Argentina. And then um, we will, um, the next speaker will be um, Dr. Ola Sandra Kepta, who is a researcher at the National University of Life Environmental Sciences in Ukraine, um, who will be discussing spatial temporal analysis of Clostridium chauvin endemic cases among ruminants and Volan Oblast in Ukraine. And then lastly, we will close with. Um, Abu Karim Abdullah Yusuf, um, who is a master's student at the Federal University of Piranha, um, Brazil, Somalia, um, seroprevalence of anti toxoplasma gondae, anti pustella species antibodies in pregnant women, and Mogadishu, Somalia. Just want to say it was at a similar meeting of this a couple of years ago, Dr. Raphael and um, Abu Karim had actually met and became um, collaborating partners. And you can see how two sides of the world could actually join. So I'm so excited to hear everybody's presentation. Um, Dr. Joseph, the, um, the podium is yours. If you could share your slide. Kaylee, do you have to stop sharing your screen? Uh, no, Dr. Joseph is not on the session. Okay. Do we have next speaker, Dr. Govida? Yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajmahan, um, you're still muted, but you have permission to share your screen. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Are you, we're not able to see anything? I think there may be a connection delay. Yeah, can, hello, can you see my slides? No, we can hear you, but we cannot see your slides. Okay, okay, one second, I'm just trying out now. Perfect. We can see your slides. Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can I go ahead with this, or I need to uh, basically uh, 
increase the slide size or can you see? No, if you could hit this, the yeah. increase it, like do the slide share. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll do it once again. Can you see now full slides? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I start now? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, actually. So it's a greetings uh, from India. I'm uh, Dr. Raj Mohan. So uh, my topic uh, today, I'll be discussing about the role of uh, flavohemoglobin from multidrug resistant Staphylococcus aureus in cellular physiology and uh, <coughs> virulence, actually. So basically, I'm uh, situated in India. It's an um, institute of uh, microbial technology. It is a government of India institutions. So let's see uh, about the work which we have done over the past many years. Uh, if you see the background and um, the introductions, so like, you know, you know, hemoglobins are very much uh, familiar with uh, everybody. It's a hemoglobin, we know it is a very ancient hemoproteins, widely distributed in all five kingdoms of life. They all have ability for uh, to bind molecular oxygen reversibly and other gaseous ligands such as nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide. So like say like 50 years back, uh, Professor Dale Webster from Illinois Institute of Technology discovered the first hemoglobin in bacteria that uh, surprisingly uh, initially was identified as a cytochrome uh, O, but later they identified it is uh, purely uh, hemoglobin from uh, bacteria. So it, the bacteria which uh, they identified a hemoglobin is uh, vitrocella hemoglobin, belongs to gram-negative bacteria. So from then uh, onwards, a lot of research is being um, on interesting results are started uh, because bacteria also having a hemoglobin, like a human hemoglobin. Hemoglobins. So, if you see the bacterial uh, hemoglobins are broadly uh, classified into three uh, different groups: single domain hemoglobins, um, that is the one which was identified initially by Dr. Uh, Dale Webster, and uh, later they identified also double uh, domain hemoglobins. And uh, very recently, in last uh, decade, they identified a new type of uh, uh, hemoglobin group uh, is called truncated hemoglobins. So <clears throat> today, I'll be talking much about uh, these double domain hemoglobins. So what are these? These are nothing but a two domain hemoglobin. That's it has a two domains. One is globin and is other is reductase domain, where the heme is so basically the heme domain is linked with different reductase or sensory domains. So like these uh, domains, uh, like you know, these hemoglobins are uh, widely uh, present in the uh, different kingdoms, as I said before. And a lot of microbes also harboring such hemoglobins. Um, and uh, even though they have a same protein uh, globin fold, they have a diverse uh, functions. You can see the functions of these hemoglobins are identified in different bacteria, so ranged from uh, typically the oxygen transfer and storage is the primary function. And besides that, we can see various functions uh, in uh, literature. You can see uh, broadly on uh, different stress response uh, uh, challenges. You can see the, these ba bacterial hemoglobins play a major role. So besides, like you know, on uh, because of a lot of genome sequences available, you can uh, easily see it from the genome sequence uh, analysis. A lot of uh, bacteria, either from um, uh, different uh, groups like the gram positives or negatives, you can see more than one or two uh, hemoglobins so that belongs to either single domain or uh, mostly double domains will be there, and uh, either single or truncated hemoglobins will be there in some bacteria. So most of the bacteria harboring more than one hemoglobins. Uh, so nobody knows that those times like uh, what is the role of these uh, hemoglobins because uh, these are pretty much uh, uh, conserved in most of the bacteria. And that's what uh, like you now people started asking questions. So what is the role of these hemoglobins in this bacteria uh, besides um, uh, oxygen transfer or storage purposes? So the study which we started initially um, the, uh, try to uh, address these questions in uh, one of the important uh, 
uh, bacterial pathogen that is called Staphylococcus aureus. We know it's a gram-positive cocci and mostly very common uh, pus-causing organisms uh, which produces large number of toxins and virulence and it uh, basically um, uh, like you no know, leads to simple to complex infections. Uh, because these uh, factors also consider a um, long time back and this and a couple of years back like you not know, a few years back who also declared these as high priority pathogens so <clears throat> this is the model organism which we are trying to uh, we we have used and trying to ask a fundamental question like what is the role of uh, these hemoglobins because uh, from the genome sequence we identified two type of uh, hemoglobins in this uh, bacteria one is uh, uh, truncated uh, hemoglobins uh, and other one is a double domain hemoglobin that is also called flavor hemoglobin. So today I will be talking more about only the flavor hemoglobin, uh, no, not about the other uh, hemoglobin which we have also characterized. So the methods uh, uh, which you can see is basically we have used uh, the standard uh, uh, bioinformatic uh, uh, analysis uh, and also the um, um, like you no know, standard molecular biology techniques like a cloning expression and that we have done a biochemical characterization to uh, find out whether this uh, gene is really a hemoglobin or not and uh, try to understand the regulatory aspect of this gene in the native host. So uh, basically, we have tried to uh, use the uh, sequence analysis uh, and uh, using a multiple sequence analysis, we have identified a similarity and identity analysis. So further, uh, the, like you know, we also try to model and find out whether this is uh, very much similar with uh, some uh, known structure or not. So this is the basic uh, study design. Uh, the, the basic purpose is just to find out uh, the gene which we have found, uh, which is not characterized, and it is also annotated as hypothetical in some bacteria. So we want to identify whether this is really a hemoglobin or not. So for that, uh, first we have uh, done is like you no know, so, sort of a, a very short uh, informatic uh, analysis uh, where we have sequenced multiple um, uh, like you no know, hemoglobins. Uh, it is uh, from either the state by state bacterial uh, hemoglobin. Uh, that is called HMPs, uh, and also compared with uh, different uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, both from uh, positive, uh, like uh, uh, both uh, like you know, uh, pathogenic and non-pathogenic uh, group of uh, uh, Staph aureus. So primarily, uh, you can um, um, now you can see like these HMP that is a flavor hemoglobin, uh, known to have a two domain. One is a globin, other is a reductase. And both FAD or NAD binding uh, site will be there. These are pretty much conserved in all the sequences which is well conserved and conservation is more than 60% uh, compared to other bacterial groups. I can see from here, but sorry, very small uh, slides are uh, a little bit congested over here, but you can see like uh, within Staphylococcus aureus, these HMPs are uh, very much uh, significantly conserved more than 99% INDT with a similarity also sort of a 99%. 0.7% or 100%. So when compared to other bacterial groups besides Staphylococcus aureus, these are also conserved, which amounts more than 50 to 60% uh, similarity. So overall, um, based on uh, like E. coli is the standard uh, uh, strain where, where people have uh, nicely characterized the HMP protein. So we have used um, those uh, uh, protein structure and try to uh, model it and find uh, the fold also very much similar like we can see even though they have not have a uh, significant homology um, in terms of sequence they have a sequence similarity of more than 70 percent but so structurally it is able to have two typical domain of globin uh, domain and reductase domains so next we since we know that uh, very much convincingly we identified that uh, this whatever the gene has um, identified from the sequence analysis it is uh, looks like a hemoglobin so we have cloned and uh, expressed in uh, under a strong promoter and purified it using a two step protocol uh, protocol where uh, on analyzing this purified protein which is uh, also you know elix uh, red uh, tinge color always because uh, because of heme uh, content and this uh, 
um, purified protein was further subjected to uh, absolute spectral characterization, basically just to see whether all hemoglobin exhibit a um, uh, typical spectral uh, features, and that is uh, the sorted peak. And on oxygenated, it, the peak goes to um, a little higher in 428. And on upon reducing with sodium diethanate, it goes down to 418. So these uh, clear cutly uh, indicates that this protein, whatever the protein which we have annotated or we have taken it as a hemoglobin, uh, considered as a functional, very, very much functional um, hemoglobin proteins. And we know this hemoglobin also known to have uh, oxygen um, uh, um, re reducing or storage property basically. So that's what we asked with these uh, hemoglobin, the cells harboring uh, the hemoglobin gene that is HMP confer advantage to the uh, E. coli cells because we have cloned it in E. coli in the heterologous host. So using uh, both the conditions, high aeration or low aeration, in either of these cases, you can see in the graph that is the uh, dotted uh, unfilled uh, uh, inverted triangle, which basically it uh, belongs to uh, Staphylococcus hemoglobin, which is cloned in E. coli compared to the E. coli hemoglobin. And we have a vector control over here. So based on these uh, uh, graphs, you can see it's, uh, it is not a very significant advantage is giving to the Else, at least we can say like more than one fold, like one to 1.5, precisely 1.5 fold um, uh, the advantage, uh, growth advantage gives to the uh, insulin basically. So then since these uh, hemoglobins are known to have uh, affinity for different ligands such as nitric oxide or carbon monoxide, and we have uh, basically tried to characterize the ligand pro binding properties uh, and <coughs> can uh, try to uh, understand the ligand properties like um, oxygen uptake or NO uptake compared to the E. coli HMP, which is uh, considered as a standard. And uh, we uh, basically compared with uh, the standard strains. And you can see here uh, the oxygen uptake is uh, uh, significantly uh, higher in both the cases, like uh, compared to the E. coli um, uh, HMP. Uh, and similar in case of NO also, NO uptake is significantly higher in case of um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus hemoglobin expressed in E. coli. So which clearly indicates this uh, uh, hemoglobin protein has uh, uh, high nitric oxide dioxygenase activity and also significantly binds to both um, the ligands oxygen and nitric oxide. So these are the some of uh, now further we asked whether these uh, strains are uh, basically uh, like no we exposed to nitric oxide uh, so because you, you can um, like you know staph aureus generally uh, encounter both uh, oxidative or nitrostatic stress during a host of pathogen interactions. So that's what uh, the purpose is just to since it is able to bind nitric oxide efficiently. Uh, the primary function of hemoglobin, uh, flavor hemoglobin, is uh, known to have nitric oxide dioxinase activity. Uh, so we asked whether these um, uh, E. coli cells, which is expressing Staphylococcus aureus hemoglobin, flavor hemoglobin, be able to protect uh, the E. coli cells against nitrostative stress. So the NO donor which we have used is sodium nitroprusside, SNP. So you can see in this graph, the different concentrations of SNP we have used and uh, we try to score the uh, survival of the cells. And you can see on increasing the concentration of SNP um, the, compared to the <coughs> vector control PBS, then uh, both E. coli and uh, uh, Staphylococcus flavor hemoglobin. E. coli we have taken as a control. And this is a Staphylococcus uh, hemoglobin able to uh, basically protect the cells from uh, killing of nitric oxide, uh, that is uh, SNP. So uh, further, uh, since we uh, clear cutly are able to see um, these uh, flavor hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin able to confer uh, resistant to nitrostatic stress. And further, we want to uh, really check it within a different host, uh, like we have used here Salmonella uh, typhimurium cells, where uh, the HMP gene was knocked out. So basically, this is a, a null mutant uh, 
uh, HMP null mutant of cellular cells, where we try to express our, we have expressed our uh, Staphylococcus hemoglobin inside uh, this um, a host and try to ask the similar questions. But here we have used a nitrate uh, uh, basically uh, substrate. Like you know, what happens is like you know, if you under a low pH conditions, this protonation of nitrate leads to toxic nitrogen products. That is a different and reactive nitrogen species. Uh, it will release into the medium. So that's what like basically. We try to S7, and uh, this is uh, along with the different concentration. We have used a vector control as a PBS, and we have used trains, uh, which is expressing hemo flavor hemoglobin, and also the staph uh, hemoglobin. Basically, in a staph in salmonella uh, typhimodium cell, mm -hmm. see, the background is salmonella cells, where these uh, proteins are expressed inside. So if you see, in, uh, yeah, we have used both 10 and uh, 30 millimolar nitrate, uh, sodium nitrate, and uh, both uh, cases in both the pH. In both the cases, if you see like in case of uh, pH 6, you can see like uh, the staph or yes, HMP is only here. And when you, once you add uh, different concentrations of HMPs like 10 millimolar, 30 millimolar, 30 millimolar, you can see uh, even then it is not um, significantly uh, killing the cells when compared to the control. This is the control where the uh, PBS uh, vector control. You can see on uh, adding a 30 millimolar nitrate, <clears throat> it is uh, a significant fold. Uh, it is uh, basically protecting the cells uh, by the staph uh, HMP. So this one type of phenomenon is not occurred in the pH 7 which is a very known phenomenon here. So therefore, we can conclude this, uh, the staph HMP not only confers uh, uh, um, nitrostative stress, not only confers the cells against nitrostative stress in E. coli, but also in salmonella typhimurium. So because we know this staph aureus uh, doesn't have any, uh, like so far, whatever the bacterial um, uh, flavor of hemoglobin uh, genetic regulation was steady, and we found that all the bacteria will be having a typical, uh, like a repressor protein. It's a global repressor protein will be there. That uh, global repressor protein was not found specifically in Staphylococcus aureus because these uh, flavor hemoglobin needs to be tightly regulated in the bacteria. So that's what like we want to see whether at what phases of growth is being um, produced more. So we try to uh, map it with uh, RT-PCR and find uh, found that it is uh, largely expressed more in a stationary phase and exponential phase when compared to the lag uh, phase of a uh, growth. So <clears throat> since uh, the Staphylococcus aureus also doesn't have a, uh, like a typical repression uh, global repressor, which is called NSSR, uh, very specifically repressed uh, by the hemoglobin. So we asked uh, how these genes are being regulated. So in that case, we try to uh, uh, analyze the promoter sequence of these HMP. And uh, on analyzing, we found uh, like typically multiple sites of a SARA, which is a transcriptional global transcription regulator SARA, which is uh, uh, well studied in Staphylococcus aureus, known to regulate more than 100 uh, genes, both in uh, bacterial physiology as well as in virulence. So these uh, uh, gives a lot of clue where probably SARA might be regulating uh, the HMP. So that to test this hypothesis, we cloned SARA from E. coli, uh, from uh, Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli, we purified and we have performed the in vitro uh, simple gel shift assays. Uh, where we try to uh, radio label the promoter uh, region and try to challenge the SARA protein in uh, with the different concentrations and concentration dependent with keeping positive and negative controls. Uh, uh, and we can see the clear cut shift. Uh, uh, you can see that is shift indicates the binding of a protein to the promoter, thereby increases the molecular weight of the um, uh, protein DNA complex basically. So this clearly indicates uh, these um, uh, like you no, know, basically the SARA efficiently binds to this promoter and also uh, probably we are hypothesizing it is probably the prime regulator which controls the expression of uh, HMP. Dr. So, Gurindan, can I just give you a one minute warning at this yeah. time? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. 
So if you see, I'll sum up uh, here, like, you know, if you broadly what has uh, seen is we have identified uh, flavor hemoglobin G in uh, staph aureus, uh, and uh, which is also functionally, we have characterized both biochemically and functionally. And uh, spectral okay. characteristics is very similar to known uh, HMPs, and uh, it provides a very marginal growth advantage. And interestingly, it uh, exhibits an open suction activity, uh, and uh, it also protects an inhibitor status. So we have, uh, for the first time, we have shown these virulence uh, fire regulator, which is a globally uh, found in uh, Staphylococcus aureus. The SARA is uh, regulating the Staphylococcus aureus uh, HMP. So, if you see in terms of uh, definitely uh, these uh, genes are uh, ubiquitously found in uh, most of the bacteria, but in Staph aureus, uh, due to because these are in, uh, much uh, regulated uh, under the stress conditions, probably a general transcription regulator like a sigma P. Uh, goes up when ATP of a cellular content goes down uh, due to stress um, or any other impact, and it induces a SARA uh, protein, and further it will be regulating the HMP. So pro probably this uh, HMP uh, might be regulating as a central uh, hub for uh, you know, nitrosity stress uh, regulator. And uh, interestingly, we found that all the pathogenic strains uh, of uh, different uh, strains we have checked, uh, like of, um, these expressions are found to be significantly higher, which also very much uh, correlated a lot of uh, um, a couple of studies from different groups in uh, E. coli and uh, Pseudomonas. They have shown the pathogenic strains uh, known to harbor uh, like you no know, more uh, highly expressed uh, uh, like HMP uh, will be there. And uh, we also try to understand how these uh, uh, we can uh, connect it with the AMR because many of the bactericidal antibiotics are known to exhibit either oxidative or nitrosity stress. Uh, so we have uh, done some preliminary uh, analysis where we could see uh, these um, uh, stress also we, uh, like you no know, specifically nitrosity stress or uh, these um, HMP can be basically uh, modulated uh, some of the antibiotic resistance there. So what we can see in the overall, uh, these flavor uh, hemoglobin can be uh, exported as a potential target for uh, antimicrobial therapies. This is a, a short story which uh, we are uh, trying to understand because uh, uh, these are very much like you know, NO signaling. It is involved in uh, uh, host pathogen interaction sections. So with this, uh, I will try to fin finally uh, finish up here. I would like to thank uh, the whole organizer for the conference as well as uh, the Global One Health uh, Initiative from Ohio State University for this opportunity uh, and also I'd like to thank uh, the director of our institute and also the, uh, my advisors, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Kanak uh, Lada Dikshit as well as uh, Dr. Ina Gupta. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. In the interest of time, there was a question, but I would like to go ahead to Dr. Rafael Vieira. If you could please share your screen. Okay, yeah. If you could unshare your screen, Dr. Majan, we'll, we'll go to the next speaker. There is a question in the box, but we will come back to it at the end. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Rafael, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael Vieira. I'm a, a federal uh, a faculty at the Federal University of Paraná. First of all, I would like to thank the 2020 Global One Health Conference uh, for choosing uh, some of our studies uh, to be presented here, and mainly the Global One Health Initiative in the person of Dr. Gebrias will always uh, be a, a, a partner uh, during our studies. So the study I would like to present today is entitled Hemotropic Mycoplasma Species and Tick-Borne Disease Pathogens in white ear, uh, ear opossums from Iguazu Falls, uh, southern Brazil, which is a three-border area uh, between Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. This study is part of a PhD uh, <coughs> Uh, for my student, Dr. Uh, Renata uh, Antonjanello at the Federal University of Paraná. 
So the white-eared opossum in Brazil is widely distributed across the country, is considered a synotropic animal, and is really adapted to anthropic actions. It is considered a source of zoonotic pathogens here, and in Brazil, they are mainly infected by uh, amblyomma and exotic species uh, ticks. The hematopoietic mycoplasma, uh, we still uh, cannot classify them as a vector-borne uh, disease uh, pathogen, but we have some evidence that they might be transmitted by vectors. So they were formerly known as hemobartonella and epiritrosome, but in 2020, Dr. Nirmark and colleagues uh, have classified them as um, uh, mycoplasmas. So they are uh, gram-active uh, bacteria, pleomorphic, that attach to the surface of red blood cells. And, and the main uh, clinical signs are uh, uh, hemolytic anemia, uh, mainly in cats and pigs. Uh, we have many of descriptions of mycoplasma uh, species infecting mammalian species worldwide, including humans. In opossums, we until uh, last year, we only have one, uh, one description, which was classified by uh, as Candidatus mycoplasma hemodidelphidis in the Delphiris virginiana, made by Dr. Masek uh, from Purdue University. And since 2002, with the last uh, publication, uh, we don't have any other uh, data on opossums worldwide. So uh, my former PhD student, uh, Paula Massini, we did a screening in opossums from a region here in Parna State, and we found uh, another one, possible uh, new species of hemotropic mycoplasma closely related to the hemotropic mycoplasma detected in the Delphis from United States. So this year we have we performed a broad study in Santa Catarina state, and we just uh, have classified as a new species, and we named uh, Candidatus mycoplasma hemobiventris, which is quite uh, different from the species detected in the Delphis from United States. And the main reason. Uh, Along with the uh, molecular data, we have some uh, hypotheses that make our data strong to reclassify and, and determine that we found a new species. Uh, we have here the distribution of both species in the United States and Brazil, and we can see that they do not overlap. So uh, cross-species transmission between the, the species from United States and Brazil uh, may not be possible. So on this partner, we have we are conducting a series of studies in opossums aiming to screen uh, those animals to tick-borne disease pathogens and to uh, detect and molecular characterize these potentially novel uh, hemoplasma species in those animals. Just to present you, this is the uh, where uh, Iguazu Falls is located in the southern part of Brazil. On the right image, you can see Iguazu Falls, which is in the middle of the Iguazu National uh, Park, right in the border uh, on the between Brazil, uh, Argentina, and Paraguay. So it is a, a very important uh, uh, point. Uh, to screen and, and, and look for zoonotic pathogens due to the high number of uh, tourists that visit the city uh, each year. So we, we work during uh, spontaneous demand. So you can see here, imagine you are doing a barbecue and you just found an opossum uh, on your, uh, uh, below your head. So people used to call the Center for Zoonosis Control and the, the 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 team go there goes there and captured the opossums then we we took back to the veterinary hospital and do a whole uh, examination clinical examination identify the animals then blood sampling and then released 
uh, in the environment. Until now, we have captured uh, 20 uh, white hero opossums. We screened for uh, some uh, tick-borne disease pathogens, and the ones positive, we uh, are uh, doing the genotyping to identify the species involved. All, neg all samples until now were negative for the uh, pyroplasma and Zarlikia anaplasma species and two animals positive for hemotropic mycoplasmas, which our uh, preliminary data shows that we also uh, found uh, the same species that we already described in opossums from Brazil. So we are now uh, looking uh, to... Uh, close uh, the whole genome sequencing of these potentially novel species in order to uh, characterize them. And also we are uh, looking for road-killed opossums in order to screen for zoonotic pathogens. Uh, we are uh, working with uh, teeters, uh, porcupines, and other uh, wild animals that are road-killed in Brazil, mainly uh, looking for the risk assessment uh, of potential human infections. I would like to thank again all the partners, uh, my PhD student Renata, uh, for the the hard work until here, and the, and the, um, the team from the Zo uh, Centers for uh, Zoonotic Disease in Iguazu Falls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Rafael. There is one question for you: um, Are mycoplasma infected possum usually symptomatic? Uh, good question. Uh, thanks. Uh, we don't know. We, we we still don't know. We didn't get any uh, uh, the detection of uh, hemotropic microbes, blood smears. The opossums is quite uh, is quite strong. Let's say that there are some studies even uh, with uh, experimental infection with a rickettsia rickettsii, which is the causative mm -hmm. uh, Brazilian spotted fever, and they do not show clinical signs. So I don't. Wow that might might cause anything on those guys. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to other that we will come back to the, um, oh, there's one additional question. Which samples are used for whole genome sequencing? Uh, explain. Excellent. Yeah. One of my questions was, how did you capture the possum to get the blood? But <laughs> in the interest of time, we'll go on to the next speaker. And then if there's questions for Dr. Raphael, as well as um, Dr. Rabna Jahava, please um, enter them into the question and we will try to retrieve. Dr. Ola Cassandra, the um, podium is yours. If you could share your slides, please. Great, we can see your slides, thank you. Yeah, um, well, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to represent my study uh, here. And um, so uh, let me introduce the topic that I'm uh, going to represent, uh, the special temporal Analysis of Clostridium shower endemic cases among ruminants in Volin Oblast, Ukraine. Um, um, analysis of publication of molecular genetic studies of the emphysematosis carbuncles causative agent Clostridium shower gives us a reason to attribute um, black like diseases to dangerous zoonoses that occurs animals and humans. Uh, the antigenic and genetic affinity of the pathogens strain to the latest from the territories of different con continents of the world indicates that its evolution as a pathogen occurred simultaneously on all continents. Evidently, uh, all continents uh, have similar conditions that have a um, decisive impact on the survival, spreading, and formation of the parasitic form of Clostridium shower. Uh, the purpose of our work uh, was to conduct a special geographical analysis of black lake outbreaks in Ukraine in order to identify patterns of disadvantage of individual territories in relation to these infections. Um, we used um, the veterinary statistics. Um, the data were uh, statistically produced and mapped to natural and geographical factors of the oblast. Um, 
slash regions uh, based on, uh, on this. Uh, uh, let me represent the results. Dr. Oleg Cassandra, uh, could you make the screen full screen, please, um, if possible? Yes, yes, uh, I'm, I'm trying. The button at the bottom right. Oh, no, over a little bit more. <laughs> Sorry. Where is it? Um, next to the 100%, there's like a full screen signal. If you could click that over, over to the left, to the left, right, over to the right, right there. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, well, welcome. Thank, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for that. Um, uh, so, uh, data from retrospective studies indicate that Ukraine is permanently affected by this infection. Uh, the analysis of veterinary data uh, shows that the most complete statistical information of black legs in Ukraine has existed since uh, 1971. Uh, so, figure one uh, indicates the uh, existence of long-lasting episodic process of uh, black leg uh, uh, in the country. Uh, the activity of the process has a temporal uh, unevenness uh, to both the detection of affected farms and to diagnosing, diagnosing clinical disease in animals. Uh, at the same time, the trends in the defection, detection of both uh, thick, animal, uh, thick animals and outbreaks of infections tend to a uh, sustainable decrease. A number of reasons can uh, explain that. Uh, firstly, uh, the sharp decline in the number of livestock in Ukraine since the beginning of the 90s, uh, for instance, uh, by the end of um, uh, 1971, uh, the number of cattle uh, was uh, 21,4 million. Uh, in uh, 1991, um, it uh, declined to uh, 24 um, uh, um, it increased uh, till uh, 24,6 um, uh, at the end of uh, 2002 years, uh, it's been um, 9,4 uh, million. And uh, secondly, there was a significant increase uh, in the use of specific black leg uh, vaccine uh, in affected areas, that is uh, implementation of specific preventive measures. For example, the number of vaccinations of cattle in the Volane uh, region, uh, Kyiv region and Lviv, uh, region from um, 49.6 uh, thousand in uh, 1971 increased uh, to uh, 220 um, thousand in um, 1985. Um, uh, however, uh, in the future, the activization of cattle dropped uh, sharply, and the uh, early um, 2000s uh, was practically stopped, uh, which accordingly reflected the clinical manifestation of infection with the high peak in incidence uh, in uh, 2005 and uh, uh, 2007. Um, uh, in uh, Episodic indices, the ratio of the number of years during which the infection was recorded on the territory to the number of years um, during which a surveillance was conducted, the mentioned administrative territories can be divided into three groups. Uh, the first group includes areas with um, episodic indices, uh, indices uh, 0 um, 0.12, um, uh, 0 0.37. Uh, it includes uh, Transcarpation, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Uh, this. Uh, uh, Cherkasy, uh, Sumy, and Poltava regions. Uh, to the second, with uh, um, uh, video episodic indices numbers um, that um, mean uh, 0 0.38 uh, till uh, 0 0.62, uh, which includes the Kirovograd uh, region, Lugansk, and Mykolaiv, um, the Crimea. Uh, Vinnytsia, Ivano-Frankivsk, uh, Khmelnytsky region, and uh, Zhitomir. Uh, the most intense episodic situation of this indicator was observed in the third group. Uh, it's uh, Donetsk, Chernobyl, Odessa, uh, Chernivtsi, Lviv, uh, Dnipropetrovsk, uh, Volin regions, uh, with, uh, where uh, um, episodic indices um, reach uh, 0, 0,68. Uh, also, um, that includes uh, regions uh, like Rivne and Kharkiv, with uh, episodic indices 0 0.8 and uh, 0 0.88, respectively. Um, the average incidence rate for the uh, clostridium shower in Ukraine during the study period was 4,35 uh, per uh, 10 uh, 
100,000 population. Um, it was the highest in uh, Chernivtsi. Um, it, um, Rivne, Lviv, Sumy, Chernobyl, Zhitomir, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, and Donetsk regions. Um, the day, death rate for the um, Clostridium Shave uh, in Ukraine is closely correlated with the incidence rate um, 0 0.9, uh, and the average death rate is um, 1464 per um, 100,000 population. Mortality, um, here is an indicator that characterizes the severity of this disease. Uh, it's average value for Ukraine, 79% uh, in each some regions uh, like Zaprisia or Transcar um, here is a Prisia or Transcarpation uh, region or Lviv. Uh, it's reached uh, 100%. Um, uh, there were the uh, Clostridium shower uh, clusters in uh, every analyzed area, uh, but uh, we chose uh, to analyze the Volin Oblast because um, the most specific territorial zones uh, were in the Volin Oblast, where we identified seven disadvantaged areas. Uh, they are usually located in river basins and uh, reclamation systems. In particular, uh, Valdemar Volin. Um, um, uh, where is this uh, Lupa River? Uh, Luga and uh, Svino uh, Rika rivers, uh, Hrohevsky um, district, uh, uh, Kovilsky and Turiski um, districts near the Tree and Stohod rivers, and reclamations and drainage system located between them. Um, also, uh, Manvitsky with the Steve River, uh, Reshinsky, uh, Rosa River, and Batakap and Stohod rivers, and uh, Kashir, Kashirsky, uh, which includes the Sir rivers. Uh, Clostridia shower cases are clustered within certain geographic areas, uh, which might be due to soil type and water permeability. Um, in position of a map uh, of disadvantages um, points on the uh, area shows that the intensity of the episodic process has the depth of aquifers. Uh, the closer they are uh, to the surface, the higher higher the probability of outbreaks of infections. Uh, with the displacement of the soil and the destructions of the surface of natural meadow pastures or high fields. Uh, the intensive malaria played an important role in surrounding and uh, in some years increasing tension of the episodic process, for example, in early um, uh, 1970s and uh, the middle of 80s years. Uh, for example, in Volin Oblast, uh, which we analyzed here, uh, the largest amount of millerated land was observed um, till um, six, uh, 62 uh, point, um, six thousand hectares in uh, 1980s. Uh, in uh, subsequent areas, the millerated areas started to decrease and within the 90s almost fully descended. A similar dynamic of millerated areas was in all regions of Ukraine. Um, other scientists um, also reported the similar close correlative connections between excavation work and increased black leg incidents. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would love to say that a natural and geographical, ge ge geological and geographical factors um, play a crucial role in shaping endemic black leg um, cases which clustered in the certain geographical areas. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lukasan. That was very interesting. What is your next step? Um, no, the next step, uh, we are going to analyze the uh, uh, souls in a, a deeper uh, level and um, probably um, analyze the correlation between the souls uh, and the like land covering and uh, cases of uh, Clostridium shower in, in, in the whole Ukraine, not only in Volin Oblast, but in, in whole Ukraine, Great. In, in case if we will uh, have a statistic data. Thank you. If you have other questions, please type them into the Q&A box for Dr. Olkatsandra. If we can go to our last speaker, um, Dr. Yusuf, the podium is yours. Dr. Olkatsandra, if you can then share your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Oh, can you unshare yours? Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah. Thank you.
Dr. Yusuf? Sorry, I don't see Dr. Yusuf on the session today. Oh, did Dr. Joseph come? No, no, no. He's, he's here. Is he's he? here. While Dr. Yusuf is setting up, maybe we can go back to one question for Dr. Um, Govinda. Um, the question was, in the SNP experiment, did you see a statistical significance difference between survival between E. coli and Staph aureus? <clears throat> yeah, that we don't see much of um, a significant difference. Basically, 